Because we have the Unit 1 test coming up, I'd like to walk you through the different chapters in the study guide. Let's start with Chapter 1. Chapter 1 was titled The Task of Theology. The first item on there is theology, and it has the word theos in there. Theology comes from two Greek words, theos and logos. Theos means God, and logos means word. So theology is words about God. Sometimes people will say the study of God. The biblical canon. This refers to the list of books that are officially in the Bible or in the scriptures. So the Bible has fan fiction, right? Books that th say they are biblical, claim divine revelation or divine authorship. But then there's the books that the church has always actually recognized as the divinely revealed word of God. And that list of books that the church has always recognized as the divinely revealed word of God, that's the biblical canon. What is in the Old Testament and in the New Testament and not just it claims to be. We have the canon decided no, um, no later than 325 AD at the Council of Nicaea. All right, the Apocrypha. This is a list of books that are added in Roman Catholic Bibles. Um, I think the Orthodox appreciate the Apocrypha as well. Uh, Protestants have never considered the Apocrypha to be in the biblical canon. Uh, Martin Luther would have said, these are worth reading. Um, and I encourage Christians to read them, but they should not be turned to for um, biblical doctrine because they're not, they're not clearly the word of God. All right, formal principle. Formal principle is that thing which forms your theology or your worldview. It is your number one source of information. It's the authoritative source that determines what your worldview is and teaches. For Christians, this would be the Bible, the Old and the New Testament. Material principle. The material principle of a religion or worldview is its chief teaching, its thesis statement. Try to summarize that worldview in one sentence, that's a material principle. And a great Bible passage for the material principle of Christianity is John 3.16, right? That God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. All right, the material principle of the, Bible, of the Bible goes straight to the gospel because the whole Bible is about Jesus Christ for you. All right, next one, ministerial use of reason and be able to explain an example of this. So the ministerial and magisterial use of reason have to do with understanding the limitations of human reason, both because we are created beings and we don't have the omniscience of God. He knows everything. And also because we are sinful beings. Ever since sin, we are corrupted, even in our reason. Just because I think something is true, it makes perfect sense to me, doesn't mean I'm right, right? So the fallibility of reason gives us, you know, reason to use it ministerially and not magisterially. What does that mean? A ministerial use of reason says, here's scripture. Scripture is true in everything that it says. And here's my reason. And if my reason cannot make sense of what scripture is saying, that's okay. I believe it because scripture says it. God's word is certainly true. So I'm just going to believe it, whether I fully comprehend it or not. That is a ministerial use of reason. So for example, if I see two passages and this Bible passage says this, and this Bible passage says this. And in my mind, that seems to contradict, or it seems to be incompatible. Well, God said both. So both are true, which means God knows that in some way these do not contradict, even if in my mind and my reason they appear to. So a ministerial use of reason would just be comfortable with saying this is true and this is true, because the Bible says both. But a magisterial use of reason does the opposite. It sets up reason not as minister to God's word, but as magistrate over God's word and authoritative. So a magisterial use of reason is a little bit puffed up. It assumes that whatever makes sense to you is true. And if God's word says this thing and God's word says this thing and they aren't compatible, well, then maybe they just aren't compatible. So maybe where God's word says this it doesn't really mean it. Or maybe where God says this, he doesn't really mean it. Maybe there's some looser interpretation that allows me to compatibilize them with my human reason. And now that I've compatibilized them with reason, now I'll confess that is true. Well, that's allowing our fallible, corrupted reason 
to trump and be more authoritative than God's word. So we should not do that if we are going to be faithful in interpreting God's word. So ministerial use of reason puts reason under God's word. Magisterial use of reason puts reason over God's word and makes it the boss. Don't do that. Traditionalism. This is an unhealthy and probably unhelpful view of tradition. Uh, traditionalism is where we believe or practice something that our, uh, that our community has done, that our ancestors have done, without understanding why. We just do it because it's always been done that way. And maybe the reasons it's been done that way or believed that way are fantastic, um, but maybe they're not. And the point is we should ask questions. We should understand our traditions. We shouldn't blindly follow them, especially as we grow up and, and learn to ask questions. You know, why do the adults do this? But a blind following of tradition is uh, called traditionalism, and it can be uh, less meaningful. It can be just kind of going through the motions. Um, it could also even be damaging if the tradition turns out wasn't very good. All right, so, and what would make a tradition good, by the way? that it points us to God's word, that it points us to Jesus Christ. All right, sola scriptura, this is the principle for Christianity, right? Our formal principle is scripture alone. We acknowledge that other things influence our theology and doctrine, but the thing that influences it in an authoritative way, the formal source of our theology, the thing that norms our theology, corrects it where we might go astray, that's scripture only. And a good Bible passage for this is Acts chapter 17. When Paul gets to Berea, it says, now these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. So they didn't just accept Paul's word that Jesus is the Messiah. They examined scripture carefully. What does it say about the Messiah, who he would be and what he would do? And they compared that to what Paul was saying about Jesus. So scripture was their formal principle for determining if Paul's message, Jesus is the Messiah, whether or not that message was true. And scripture should be our formal principle for determining whether anything we hear is true. All right, purposes for studying theology. Two that your book gives. First and foremost, to proclaim Jesus Christ. The whole Bible is about Jesus. God ultimately reveals himself to us in the person of his son. So as we study theology throughout the year, we are proclaiming the Son of God because we're studying the Bible, and the Bible is about the Son of God, Jesus Christ. And the whole purpose of Jesus revealing himself to us, revealing the Father to us, is that we might know him, believe in him, be saved by him. So that's the number one purpose of studying Christian theology, the proclamation of Jesus, because Jesus saves. And the number two purpose is to grow. We grow in our knowledge and understanding. We grow in our faith and trust. Uh, we grow in our love for our neighbor. Um, but as we study the Bible, um, it says that we are no longer infants who can be tossed to and fro by cunning or deceitful ideas. Um, instead, we know the truth and we firmly believe it and we can spot those false ideas because we're so familiar with the truth of God's word. So that's the secondary purpose, growth. How Christianity is both simple and complex. I like the analogy of... Uh, chess and tic-tac-toe um, you know tic-tac-toe is a uh, simple and simplistic right the goal is to get three in a row and don't allow your opponent to do that but it's also simplistic because you can teach someone tic-tac-toe and they can master it like five minutes later um, chess is also simple you know here are the pieces here's how they move the goal is to checkmate the enemy's king but chess is not simplistic it is very complex in strategy um, and even the best chess players in the world have not mastered it, right? They haven't gotten to a point where they never lose, right? So the Bible is like that. It is simple enough that you can teach the biblical faith, the Christian faith to a child, and they can hear and believe and be saved. But the Bible is not simplistic. You can be an 85-year-old man who's studied it your whole life, and there is still more to understand and grow in our knowledge and our faith. So the Bible is complex. We can't exhaust God's word and think we've mastered it. There will always be more to study and to learn. All right, um, exegesis or exegetical theology. So here we're getting into four divisions of theological study. The first is exegetical. That is to pull the meaning out of the text. God meant something by these words. 
the human author inspired by God meant something by these words. What do those words mean? What did they mean when they were written to the original audience? What do they mean for us today? That's exegesis, pulling the meaning out of the text. And the thing to avoid is inserting our own ideas into the text. That's called eisegesis, and that is not good biblical interpretation. So exegetical theology. Systematic theology. This is where we take all the things the text says. What does the Bible say from start to finish on this topic, on this topic, on this topic? So we kind of categorize biblical doctrine into various loci, locations, doctrines, topics, and we say, what does the Bible teach on those things? A comprehensive list of all the teachings on those things so we can have a clear systematic understanding of biblical teaching that's what we're doing in christian doctrine class historical theology this is where you study what the church has taught throughout the centuries what were they teaching in this century or in that century what are what are we teaching today it should be the same biblical faith right from start to finish the apostolic faith but you'll see different traditions and movements throughout church history you'll see even heresies that had to be rebuked and heretics that were kicked out of the church. That's all historical theology. What has the church said, taught, practiced throughout the ages? Pastoral or practical theology, this is where our theology so shapes who we are, how we think, how we speak, how we interact with others, how we behave, that the word of God is working through us now in the lives of others and how in our communication and relationships with them. That's pastoral or practical theology. It comes down to relationship and conversations. Cautions when studying theology. Your book gives three. Firstly, that we are not to treat theology just as any other academic discipline. Studying theology is different than studying science or studying English or studying math. These can be ways of studying God indirectly through his creation, science or math, or through created beings, right? God gave those authors a mind in the literature that they wrote. So you're studying the mind of God indirectly through the creatures or through the creation he has made. But in theology, we study God directly. And we do this by studying his revealed word and his revealed son, Jesus Christ. Also, we should not be upset with others if they don't share our same passion or zeal. Maybe something you're reading in the Word of God is fascinating to you and highly important to you, and it doesn't strike someone else in the exact same way. That shouldn't cause us to be upset with one another if we're passionate about different things. And then finally, um, when we are studying theology, <clears throat> it is important that we are both bold and standing up for what the Bible teaches but we do so in a kind and gentle way where people disagree with us. They don't think the Bible does teach that. So when it comes to disagreement over biblical doctrine, it is important to speak the truth in love. We, we don't fail to be truthful. No, 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 this is what the Bible says. Nor do we fail to be loving where suddenly we're yelling at our neighbor about what the Bible says. Um, the next one says five sources of Christian doctrine, how to evaluate sources, S rate. So scripture with the capital S, that's how we evaluate all things. Only scripture is the word of God. And by that, we mean the Old and the New Testament. Reason, authority, tradition, and experience all with lowercase letters because they are not our formal principle. Scripture is. Reason is just simply what makes sense to you. Um, and please use your reason. Just remember that it is limited, right? And that it is corrupted by sin. So check your reason against God's word. The same would apply to these other sources as well. Authority. Believe what trustworthy authority says. says. You have people in your life who are authorities in various ways. Listen to your pastor. Listen to your parents. Listen to your theology teacher. But also check what we say against God's word too. If something doesn't sound biblical, point it out. Authority or uh, tradition. Follow traditions. They can be helpful. They can point out blind spots. They can point us to Christ. They can point us to his word. But don't follow traditions blindly. That would be traditionalism that we talked about earlier. Experience is a powerful teacher. Learn from your experiences, but allow the Bible to help you interpret your experiences. And then finally, because different denominations put different emphases on reason, authority, tradition, and experience, that helps explain why there's denominational disagreement, both in belief and in practice. Scripture should be our formal principle. 
Finally, when scripture is silent, we should be too. Don't put words in God's mouth. What he says, he says. What he doesn't say, he doesn't say. So silent issues are silent issues.